Good afternoon, everybody. This is John Barrows. Make it happen Monday. Hopefully, you all had a fantastic weekend. I'm very excited to announce my new guest here, Latney Conant. Right? Did I pronounce that right? You got it. Awesome. You got it. From Blast Media. Latney, why don't you tell everybody, say hi to everybody, give you a little background of where you're coming from and what you're up to these days. Sure. So, I am Latney Conant, and I am actually the Chief Marketing Officer for Sixth Sense. So we are an account-based orchestration platform. And I've been at Sixth Sense uh, almost six months now, no pun intended. <laughs> Previously a uh, CMO and a sales leader at a company called Aperio. So I'm both, I'm kind of like a fox in the hen house over here in marketing. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I love it. So my background is actually marketing. That's my first degree. And then I kind of came over onto the sales side. So I have a healthy respect for both. And, and one of the things I, I was, I've been very eager to talk to you about um, is, is this whole account-based marketing thing. Because I, I, I personally am calling bullshit on it for, for a few reasons. Uh, but one of the things is, I, first of all, I think account-based marketing is really just marketing's admission that we went too far. Right, because this whole content marketing came out and it was like, yo, look at this, this is great. We're, you know, we're getting everybody, we have, there's inbound and all this other shit. And it just went a little too far, I think. And, and, and all of a sudden turned into this massive spam where there's so much noise out in the marketplace. And now I think everybody's saying, ah, okay, we kind of went a little too far. You know, let's get back to kind of being personalized and those type of things. But I have still yet to work with a company where, who is quote unquote implementing ABM and, and having it align it with sales at all, as a matter of fact. They say it does, right? And the concept is there, but, but talk to me, to help me, to pull me off the ledge that says ABM isn't just a, another acronym that is giving marketers another excuse to, to hammer our clients and, and piss, piss them off. All right. Well, I'm gonna get myself in trouble because I kind of call bullshit on ABM too, but I think, okay, it's for, I think it's for a different reason though. Okay. So let's dive into that. Yeah. So first off, we all have to recognize the way our customers prefer to buy now. Um, and there's three big ways that in B2B, all of our customers prefer to buy. Um, the first thing is they want to remain anonymous. Uh, so they want to do as much research as possible and kind of to your point about being spammed, they, they know our game, Matt, right? They know if they put in their name and email, oh God, <laughs> we're going to send them on a one way plane ticket to unsubscribe Island by just sending them a ton and ton of emails. Okay, so they all want to remain anonymous. Yep. The second thing is they buy in teams. Okay. Okay, so for the most part, um, the average decision-making team in B2B is 9.6 people. I have no idea what the 0.6 is, but that's Gartner <laughs> set. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the and average Gartner American household has 2.7 children. It's like, wow, that's a weird child, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So that's a weird 0.6 of a person. I don't know, maybe it's an intern or something. But um, anyway, so it's, but the, the point is they buy in teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a problem for traditional kind of digital marketing because we and all of our systems are set up for a lead. Right. A lead is one person, mm -hmm. a contact. And so that wreaks havoc, that second kind of buying pattern. And then the third buying pattern that we have to keep in mind is uh, buyers are actually more resistant than before. And they, they are um, even more resistant to talk to salespeople. Mm -hmm. And so they want to get farther down the process before they actually interact with a human, which means marketing actually has to carry the ball a lot farther along and actually work in conjunction with sales farther down the stage process, which again, we're just not set up to do. And so to me, what's happened is, so that's kind of what's going on with our customers, right? So now let me tell you 
I'm going to tell you the dirty little secrets about how we are set up. Yeah. Okay. So I told you there's all this activity that buyers are doing to research. Yeah. I call that your dark funnel. That's what we at Sixth Sense call it. Mm -hmm. Because there is pipeline out there, but it's not in our CRM because that's all the stuff we know about. Those are the people that have come forward. It's not in our marketing automation tool. There's this whole, like, all these great opportunities are in this dark funnel. Mm -hmm. But what we do in marketing is we produce all this content and then we put a form up because we're, we are conditioned to try to capture a lead. Right. So what happens? I put in Mickey Mouse. Yep. Gmail at gmail.com. <laughs> yeah. So 90% of the research, even on our own website, is anonymous and they're not filling out forms. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we wait for the form, we get in a bunch of Mickey Mouses, maybe we get something halfway decent. I already told you, we t send them on a one-way ticket to Unsubscribe Island. Mm -hmm. We send them a ton of emails. Then we buy a bunch of technology to uh, determine if something is an MQL. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means, but yes. <laughs> Which is a marketing qualified lead. I, no, I know, but it, it means very different things to very, like, so. Oh, yeah, people. well, we come up with a scoring schema. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then we make a bunch of charts and reports about how sales is not following up with these leads, and yeah. we're really pissed. Yep. <laughs> that's <what it> works. <laughs> so that's how the system is set up. And so then it's no wonder everyone's pissed off at one another yeah right and so abm i guess tries to come to the rescue because what abm says is abm says first of all we're gonna pick the right accounts we're not gonna you know target your grandmother's shop in her etsy shop in her garage <laughs> We're going to pick accounts that actually make sense yeah. for us and that can buy our products and solutions. So we're going to be a lot more specific about who we pick. Mm -hmm. We're then going to find out as much as we can about them so that we can then engage them the right way. And that's what you talked about being personalized, not sending a bunch of stuff that's not relevant. Mm -hmm. We're going to collaborate with sales and let them know what we're doing. And then we're gonna track real stuff. We're gonna track number of opportunities opened. We're gonna track uh, engagement levels. We're gonna track, uh, track the buying team. So mm -hmm. we're not just gonna look at one lead. We're gonna look at the entire buying team. So that's what ABM is about. The issue is because none of our systems and our data is set up to do that at scale, marketing goes to sales and says, we kind of know this is the right way to do it, but mm -hmm. we can only really do this for like 10 accounts. It's just way hard. <laughs> and that's, and that's the crux, right? Because look, I, I think we're what in this. What about my accounts? What about your accounts? Well, so it, I only get one account you're going to work on for me. And also, how do we balance that quality and quantity, right? Like, I think if it, I think if we all kind of said, hey, like, if we really honed in on our ICP, right? I think, and I think every company should do this where, like, and I don't mean just the basic demographics, their ICP, right? It's like size and industry and those type of things. I mean, like, the nuances, what technologies, what stage of the business are they at, those type of things, you know, buyer intent data, using some of that based on industry, those type of things, right? You nailed it. But the problem is, is if we really did that, to your point, we'd be only going after about 15 accounts. You know what I mean? Because like those would be the ones, right? So that's well, not true. You don't think so? I know it's not true. Okay. So let me just preface it with one more thing here though. It's like, okay, so maybe there is a, 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 a broader, a little bit of a broader audience that fits that ICP that might not be in the buying market right now, but are on the fringes that we can convince with our, with our approaches. Okay. So there's a good subset there. But we're in this world, I think, that, that we're in this weird transition where I'm a Gen Xer, okay? When I, when I grew up in sales, it was a pure numbers game. It was how many dials could you make to get how many meetings, get how many proposals, that type of thing. 
So now we have Gen Xers like me as managers saying to you know, Gen Y and millennials, um, we all recognize that quality is the answer. We all recognize that more personalized and all that other stuff is the answer. But the only thing I can measure, because I'm a lazy manager, is numbers. So how many dials did you make? Those type of things. So I think we're in this transition of quality to quantity because we're still being asked, we're saying, yeah, ABM, we got to do all this stuff, but I'm still, you're still here in reps, I make a hundred dials, follow up on every lead that I gave you, that type of stuff. So how do you balance quality and quantity with ABM? So I believe that the, what makes, you have to be able to execute that level of quality and personalization at scale. Right. How? And no, and no human or process or strategy is able to do it. You have to be able to leverage AI and big data mm -hmm. to be able to process the volumes of information and be able to pick up on the anonymous behavior. Right, by um, the intent data, right? Um, it's intent, but it's also like I talked about. So part of the dark funnel is is certainly intent, but also part of your dark funnel is who's researching and ha is not going to ever fill out that form. And there's actually ways that you can de-anonymize those accounts. Mm. Um, and so for, for us, and what we've been able to master is to say, let's just take that process that I walked you through before. Let's take account selection. I'm not going to go around to uh, Mark Ebert, who's the head of sales here and his team and say, okay, give me one account you want me to work on because that's all I can do. Um, I'm going to look at my ICP and I'm going to develop it just the way you said, and I'm going to do it on an AI and big data platform that creates a segment it's automatically going to be updating all the time and accounts are going to be moving in and out of that. So rather than ask Mark, I'm going to come to Mark and say, you know what? These are the accounts that a, we have a great fit for. We can go and sell to, which is number one. Mm -hmm. I don't want grandma's garage. I love grandma. Yeah. Don't want her garage nope. yarn making business or whatever it is. Right. So one, we can sell to them. We can make good money off of them. Two, they, um, the people that are engaging are the right buyers for us, mm -hmm. right? right. Well, These are the right really, personas. That's a huge challenge with inbounds, right? The historical fill out a form and whatever, even if they do do that nine times out of 10, it's somebody way below the power line with no decision-making authority. And we follow up with them until our teeth are, you know, until, until our eyes are blue. And then, and we're just like, and then they have no, even if we get a good conversation, it doesn't go anywhere. Right, right. So we have to be able to put together this um, picture based on a lot of data that's not known to us. And that's where AI and big data come in to be able to help us understand those personas. Are the right personas out there doing the research to say, okay, this is a real deal. Then what, when it gets really, really interesting is being able to take all of that data and actually be able to chart timing mm -hmm. and say, you know what? These guys are early stage. That's okay. That's clearly my job as the CMO to surround them with display ads. To, there are techniques that are ideal for an early stage buyer. You know, they're trying to identify their problem. They're trying to size their problem. They don't even know they have a problem. So I have to draw that out. That's my job. Mm -hmm. But when I have that map of the timing, I then can say when they're in market. Mm -hmm. That's when you and the people you're about to train in, where is it, Amsterdam or Dublin, yeah. that's what they want. They want to know this is a good fit for me. I can make money off this deal. There is a buying team. They're the right people to talk to. And they're ready to, they're going to open an opportunity. And I want to be able to get in there first. And that's the power of using AI and predictive. And so when you apply that to ABM, all of a sudden, again, it's easy to align on the right accounts, which is step one. Yep. The second um, thing I said is know everything about them. Yeah. Well, without that anonymous behavior, I'm basically going to my sales team and saying, what do you know about this account? That's not adding a lot of value. <laughs> <laughs> 
right? Or it means the only accounts I can focus on are the ones that, that we already know about. And it's like, I already have an opportunity with those guys. Right. So again, that's where being able to collect and connect all of these um, data sources outside of my organization are critical to know everything about that account base. Engage the right way. I talk a lot about personalizing for timing. Right. So I think knowing an accounts industry and knowing the persona, we all know to do that. But you have to be able to answer the question and we know the questions based on where they are. And so being able to serve that content and the right medium up based on timing. And again, that comes down to the right AI and big data, big data platforms to be able to orchestrate that. And then dance with sales on and out, right? Have, have the right platform of engagement that we can collaborate and see what have you done? What have I done? What is the intent data showing? What does the persona map look like? Who's red, who's green and align us on the, on the same metrics. I mean, I've, I've always done that. My team does not get comped on an MQL. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, their bonuses are based on how much pipe we put up per month and how much of it closes. So with that, what's the, so on perfect world, intent data, timing, the sales rep. I, what I'm worried about right now is that marketing is getting, is getting better and they're getting significantly better with AI and a lot of these tools to understand. And also you marry that to the fact that the buyer is going further and further and further. I mean, one of the stats that blew me away recently that I found was that the G2 crowd, right? Th they are the top 250 most trafficked website on the internet. So if, if you just put that in context, you got Facebook, you got Amazon, you got, and then a B2B review site is top 200. So that is telling me that there is a whole host of people out there that are way before they're engaging with a sales rep are doing way more Intel. And it's not just them being on our websites. They're going asking their peers like, Hey, I'm thinking about looking at a solution like this. What are the rec you know, who are at least the ones that people recommending, right? So with that, with marketing getting smarter and smarter and smarter, the client having less and less desire to talk to a sales rep or at least pushing it further and further, where does that leave the sales rep in this equation? I mean, is it like, I, I always look at the last mile, we're the last mile before it, before it hits the client, we humanize it. But help me understand, like how do your reps use the data that you provide them to reach out to that client from a timing standpoint? I mean, and I'll just dumb it down here a little bit for my benefit. It's, you know, is it, hey, um, I saw these things and you're doing these things and I know you're at this stage of your business, so we have a solution that can support that? Or is there a little bit more of an eloquent way that, that your team uses the data to engage with somebody from a personalized standpoint? It isn't effectively like, yeah, I see you've been looking at a bunch of crap and I, and I can tell you're at this stage of your business, so let's talk. What's the, what's that, what's that last mile that the sales rep needs to bring to the table to humanize this and, and, and add value? Sure. So we've done it. We did a study um, and we looked at client, we looked at when we make a prediction that an opportunity is going to open and when an opportunity actually opens. Mm -hmm. And we found that our clients can get into deals 58 days earlier okay. than they otherwise could have. Yep, which is huge. Which is huge. Yeah. So I don't think the, you know, we always learned to get there first mm -hmm. and to influence the process mm -hmm. and to be the educator. I don't think that changes at all. Okay. And I don't think that role of the sales rep changes at all. I will say, I think that you have to be even more consultative than before mm -hmm. because the what keeps you up at night they they we've established what what has kept you up at night yeah. and so you have to be able to go very very deep and own more things like the deployment plan for example and you know how you really how you compare and contrast to your competitors so i do think you're going to see salespeople become more and more specialized in by industry because they have to be a, a lot more consultative. Okay. 
so so th- and this is exactly wh- what brings my concern to the, to light which is i think that that especially inbound right? if i'm a if i'm a um if, if i'm 68 percent of the way through the sales product all of a sudden I, I abm you educate me and now i want to talk the last person i want to talk to is some 22 year old wet behind the ear kid who's going to ask me bant questions and you know what i mean like that's the last person so my my hypothesis here is is that specifically the inbound is actually going to increase significantly as far as uh, it's going to be more of a customer success or customer support person who is very educated on the product very you know what i mean and less of a commission but more of a base and and, and it's really going to be their job to guide them through the rest of that 20 some odd 30 percent right um, so I guess, you know, and this is just a bigger picture discussion. I'm curious to your thoughts. Like, where does that leave the 22 year old kid? Like if, if we are educating so much and by the time they're engaging with us, they're, you know, they're there and you got this 22 year old kid who's just coming out of school, just got stuffed a bunch of product knowledge down their throat and really has limited sales education. Like, where does that leave that? And where, and where does that evolve us to? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why so many companies are starting to, have a lot more sales tiers. Mm -hmm. And when I say that it's, you know, you set up your BDRs, which is outbound outreach. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are, you know, kind of just out of college, hungry. And I, I, I do still think, you know, and, and what we coach on is, you know, that highly personalized outreach and Mm -hmm. email. But again, it's based on, it's not, oh, you know, we see you like the Cubs. We like the Cubs too. It's, we understand this is your problem. Mm-hmm. And because of all the data I talked about, and then you can marry it but you why know, can't, back to them. Why can't marketing do that? So, so I, I'm going to keep pushing here because sure. what I'm serious, what I'm like literally freaked out about is that artificial, I mean, I'm seeing emails right now that artificial intelligence is writing that's better than any sales rep I, I ever seen, right? I'm seeing more insight and analysis, right? Where, where, I mean, literally, why wouldn't, with all the information that you're putting and all the stuff that I do and all the stuff that you know about me, why, why aren't we to the point when it comes to outreach specifically, like reaching out to me, why aren't we at a point where marketing can do everything? Because I think the things that I described to you, I mean, we started this call by saying, this is how most marketing departments do it. And ABM is focused on 10 to 20 accounts, right? So there is a transition that we're going through. Um, I, there is still like a human element to meeting, especially if you think about field marketing and, you know, getting people to come to a dinner with their peers Mm -hmm. or being at an industry show. And I, the way I do marketing are one of the reasons that they wanted me to do it was I was so passionate about field marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mother-in-law says, I just like to throw good parties, which is, (laughs) Uh, but there is a connection that you make when um, you do, you know, you, you have that face-to-face connection. And so I don't think that'll ever go away. I think it is condensed. I think people are going to have to be more experienced, but I, I think when you think about field marketing and the, and prepping for events and like getting, um, people signed up for meetings and, and dinners and things like that, there still is a pretty significant role for um, that BDR type team. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree that there's a role. I just think it's a diminishing role. I, I do think that, you know, the typical SDR role that is right now, and I don't know if you're seeing it, but like the typical SDR role, I'm seeing evolve much more into a marketing and operations role than it is to a sales role. Right. Because if you think about if we tie if we if we tie all this data that's coming to us and then we come up with messaging based on triggers and personas and those type of things, it's no longer me now as an SDR sitting down and figuring out, okay, what am I now going to say to this client? It's now saying, well, they're at this stage of the process. This is the persona. So where's my persona messaging? Where's my trigger based messaging? Where's some content that I can layer into this? And now let me put together that cadence and then send it out there. Right. And then analyze the results to split test, try different approaches. So, you know, 
I'm just trying to figure out where that kind of intro sales rep role, because, you know, predictable, re- predictable revenue, the segmentation of roles, I think was fantastic for, yeah. for organizations from a scale standpoint. But where I don't think predictable revenue has done any favors is in the customer experience. Because nobody wants to be handed off five times before they actually talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. So I, I actually almost envision it going back to more of like a pod structure where there's one sales rep that is educated enough to bring them through the journey after they get to that 57% and take it from there as opposed to then how now qualifying then flipping. Right, right, right. right. Cause we, and we should be able to better qualify along the way using AI and big data. I just don't think that is there right now. And I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to have different paths for that entry level role either. No, right? I think it's a good like thing. Maybe they do, you know, become more on the marketing side and, and take leadership roles there. I mean, marketing is becoming more and more AI analytics, data, ops, tech. Yeah. So those are still really relevant skills. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep getting this concept that I keep having, which is like, you know, the, the last mile. The sales rep is the last mile, right? Yeah. I, so I'm, I'm sure you follow Gary Vaynerchuk, right? So, or at least know of him. Um, are you familiar with him? Mm-mm. Oh, you're not? Oh, no. Follow, like, he's batshit crazy, but, but he's legit. So Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he talks about, um, he's like, from a branding standpoint, he's off the charts, right? Social branding, all that stuff. And he's got a whole... The, Play, uh, company called Vayner, Vayner Media, which helps some of the biggest brands in the world from their own personal branding and stuff like that. And it was funny because he, you know, he talks about this, you know, everybody talks about content is king, content is king. He said, fine, if content is king, then context is God. <laughs> right? And that got me that's thinking. That's the timing about, thing. That's well, what I said. That's sales and marketing, right? Marketing yeah. content, sales is context. And if we as sales professionals, so that's kind of the connection I made. And if, so for us as sales professionals, if we're not putting any context around this content, we're no different than marketing. And, and I don't know why we're getting paid to do what we do. And one of the things that when I went to, because he, you know, I, about two years ago, I looked for a marketing to, company to help me and my brand, right? I was oh, like, oh, cool. let me try Gary, right? And I'm like, let's see what, and it was like starting at half a million dollars. I'm like, yep, nope, okay. <laughs> Maybe that's why I haven't heard of him. <laughs> yeah, right? so, but they, they can do this thing where it's, it's called the 4D session where you go to his office in New York and for 10 grand, you sit down for a day and you, you, it's like 10 to 15 other entrepreneurs and business owners or whoever. And, and he goes through and every department head comes in and shares with you like the latest and greatest stuff that they're working on some of their biggest clients with, right? So branding, social, the tools, all that stuff. And then he comes in at the end and he does a Q&A for your business. And one of the things he did, like, so my question was, I saw this AI, this was two years ago. I saw this AI voice, like email that went out that I literally was the exact email that I trained and was the, as personalized as you could possibly get. And, it, and, and the person who sent it to me, I was like, are you serious right now? Because they were like, hey, John, check this out, right? And I was like, there's no human involvement. And he said, no. And, and by the way, it took 70 seconds. So I was like, holy shit. And this is when I was like legit freaking out about artificial intelligence. I'm like, we're, okay, we're dead. Skynet's here. We're all over, right? Um, but, but he said, I said, so where does that leave us? And what he said was interesting to me. He's like, don't, don't try to fight AI. You're not going to fight it. It'll beat you eventually. Right, be, right. He said, be, be the guy that reviews the AI email before it, before it goes out. Because there's always going to be something that the human eye picks up. And until robots buy from robots, right, there's still going to be that empathy. There's still going to be that thing. And, and you probably know more about this than I do. There's like a pattern, like the human eye picks up patterns, right? right. And so like no matter how personalized an email gets, if it's, if it's a template or if there's some, the human eye is going to probably pick up on something that's going to say, ah, that's suspect. And as soon as I think it's suspect, I'm not going to trust it, right? Right. So, and so, sales is about trust. And, and I think that's where we're getting to is like, how can the rep without just cranking out template emails without, how can they use this ABM information that you are providing us with to layer on that final mile, some context that makes the human connection. And I think those are going to be the sales reps that, that, that thrive. And the other ones, unfortunately, I think are just not going to get replaced, but shifted drastically over to marketing and operations. Yeah. And that's why we, when we align with sales, our biggest alignment spot is in prioritization. 
Okay. So because we do want people to spend more time and be more personalized. And so the onus is on us to help them prioritize and make sure that the, um, we call it a six QA, a qualified account, really is qualified and they really are in market and it's a good use of their time. So and, and, uh, and so we, and we do like back tests and things like those, that things like that to test our model mm -hmm. um, and test the conversions against, you know, if you weren't using the model and it's a 40% improvement um, to, you know, in opportunity creation. Nice. And so that, that, like, to me, that's, if I can give you the gift of time, you, you know, you've been a sales leader, you know, that's, mm. that's the only asset I have is my time. Most valuable one I have. Yep. Yep. And so if I can help you prioritize and say, you can take that extra time and you can bring empathy and you can personalize it because I don't want you working on a hundred emails today. You know, I'm going to give you the priority of the ones that are really good. So, so there does have to be alignment, right? Because that, that's what frustrates me is, is when I, when, again, I hear from leaders, yes, we need to be more personalized, but yet they're still telling their reps to make $50 a day. They're still telling them to do a hundred activities on a daily basis. And I just don't understand. I don't know whether that's a, eventually it's going, that's going to break, or if that's a segmentation standpoint, look, I get it. Like, I don't think ABM is appropriate, but well, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think ABM is appropriate for SMB, like people who are selling to the SMB, right? If you're, if your addressable market is, you know, a, you know I, I mean, I guess at the best level with all the tools working the right way, but for the most part, if you're, you know, SMB and your ACV is, you know, less than 500 bucks, ABM sales part of that is, is a little questionable where it really flies in sales and marketing working together is mid market enterprise where you get some, you know, the buyer intent and the ACV a bigger, a bit bigger. That's kind of my perception of, you know, it's not for everybody. Is that accurate? So uh, it, it really comes down to, are there multiple people in a defying decision? Mm -hmm. So if, if it's just one person who decides that's B to C. Yep. model like right if if it's a buying team or they need to ask people that's when you have to think about how you coordinate those outreaches mm -hmm. to all of those different personas um i will say at six cents one of the things that we are strong at is being able to de-anonymize smaller companies so even smb we can still de-anonymize that company Okay. Whereas um, it's pretty easy to de-anonymize really, really big. It's just an IP lookup. Right. Um, but as companies get smaller because of the way we use cookies and device IDs, we can actually de-anonymize for the SMB too and give a lot of these powerful things to people that are selling to SMB as well. So do you recommend stuff to say? to the sales rep, you know what I mean? Based on where they are and, and the intent data and those type of things, do you actually recommend, hey, by the way, you should probably go after them with this type of message or do you kind of leave it up to the sales rep to say, hey, they're in the market, it's a good time, here's the indicators, now it's you? It's, they're in market, it's a good time, here are the personas, yeah. um, here, here are the things the personas are going to overlap in caring about because that's really important because and this kind of goes back to your thinking about the role of a salesperson i think salespeople are more and more therapists now um because a lot of your role is actually helping internally a company get consensus yeah oh yeah that's a whole uh, challenger sale versus challenger buyer. I don't know if you've read challenger buyer. I love challenger buyer. Right? Yeah. I'm obsessed with the challenger buyer. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so true. Yeah. And, and so part of what we come up with for reps is saying, okay, you've talked to the CMO and they're really interested. They're going to have to go to the CIO. So we need to prepare the CMO with what the CIO is going to think yep. and want to say. So it's like a weird, like new level of messaging that you have to be able to, to understand the organizational dynamics and the nuances between those functions. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's a really important kind of coaching and content um, strategy. You got to be able to understand based on the timing, what questions they're going to be able to ask or, or you know, the, the challenger buyer or challenger customer talks about buying jobs. So we do a lot of our content creation based on buying jobs. And because we know the timing, we can predict what buying job they're going to be doing and what we need to create to help them do that buying job. Nice. Um, and then last with intent data, you can look at real time behavior and how the behavior is changing. And like, for example, um, you know, before we walk into a meeting, we can real time see, I, I always know competitors in a deal. Yeah. Because I have all, I, again, have all the intent data. I, I know who else they're researching and that's really helpful. <laughs> you know, that's going to help me. Or, or if, you know, an account starts ghosting me, um, I can see why. Yeah. Well, it looks like they started talking to this person. Okay. So we need to understand that. So, you know, just marrying the understanding of their digital signal up against kind of what the face-to-face -face conversations is super helpful. Uh, and I think that goes back to that context, right? Like just, you know, knowing that and then figuring out how to address it from a sales to your point, being a therapist to a certain degree, to ask the right questions, to uncover whether they're being transparent with you or they're full of shit. You know what I mean? Like and people hate confrontation and they yeah. think they can lie to salespeople. So they're going to say, Oh no, we're not talking to anyone else. And you're right. like, oh, I know you are. <laughs> well, and, that, and, that, and that in and of itself tells me that the likelihood of, of us being successful. I mean, if I know you're using, if you're talking to three competitors of mine and I ask you, Hey, who else are you talking to? And you're like, well, no, we're just, you know, we're just kind of in the preliminary phases. Like right now, my chances of winning that deal fall through the floor because you're already lying to me up front. You know what I mean? So, you know, and, and how you handle that, I think is the art of the sales rep, figure yes. out a way to navigate that and use that in a positive, you know, direction as opposed to a negative. Um, and that's why, I, you know, I, my philosophy always, you know, has, has been, you know, I think AI and, and a lot of this stuff, is going to make good sales reps great, great sales reps incredible, and average sales reps irrelevant. And that's kind of what my thought process is for the sales. Because what I do is, you know, when I train, I try to get sales reps to wake up to say, just stop going through the motions. Because marketing is doing a better job than you are. If you're just going to go through the motions, if you're just going to crank out template emails and drone through, you know, PowerPoint presentations and demos and stuff like that, I don't need you as a sales rep. I don't need to pay a sixty, seventy thousand dollar base salary plus, you know, hundred plus K, you know, for you to push a button. You know what I mean? Like I, I need a sales rep that's gonna put some thought into this, that's gonna take the information that marketing provides to me and put some context around it and make it relevant to the person that I'm reaching out to and show that I give a shit. Yeah, I think I think it's challenging us all to up our game. It is. It is. And and I guess that's a, you know, one of my final questions here for you is where do you see this going? I mean, I I I think that we have a long way to go to, to get to where you, what you painted as kind of the, the, what it should be versus what it is, ABM, right? The promise of ABM versus the reality of ABM for the majority of organizations. But say we, say we recognize, say, say that that happens in the next year or two or whatever it is where all the stars align, I get the intent data, I get the right information. Where does that evolve the model uh, from a sales marketing alignment, from a, from a predictable revenue standpoint? Are you seeing anything that's saying, you know, I see if all the boxes are checked that it does what it should do, this is what the kind of quote unquote future looks like from a sales and marketing standpoint? I, well, I think it's sales, marketing, and customer success. Okay. So I think of it in conjunction as a revenue team. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the reason it's all converging is we talked about sales reps needing to be a lot more educated on the product or solution, right? So almost customer success like, but sales savvy, right? So, and they are later in the process. So those roles are, have a, you know, are kind of combining. We talked, and then my role in marketing is also combining a little bit with customer success as well, because the other thing you mentioned was they're going to G2 crowd, they're asking their friends. And so my time actually, there, there's 
what we talked about with ABM and setting up the process and the technology and leveraging data and AI in a whole new way and investing in the right platforms that allow me to do that. But I also have to be out connecting and building advocacy within that customer base and mm. working with customer success a lot more closely to make sure that I have what we call an amplifier. Like it's one thing if you are happy, but are you out there promoting us? Um, and so that's a change in, in kind of how marketing is now evolving with customer success as well. So I think those three together um, have to work a lot more closely. And, and to your point, I mean, I think a lot of, you know, yes, sales has to become more customer success, but customer, I'm, I'm bumping into a ton of customers who are now asking customer success to become more sales, right? Cross sell, upsell, that type of stuff. Oh, and, yeah. And it's funny because it's, it's like somebody who gets into customer service, a lot of times they get into customer service or success because they don't want to be in sales. And, you know, and, and how sales has been presented to them as ill gives them the ickies, right? So now they're in customer success. Great, I get to serve as a customer. And then they're being asked, okay, now you got to go find, you know, 50% of your book is going to be upsells, cross sells. Like, oh, crap, I don't want to do this. But the funny thing is, is if you take the word sales out of the equation, customer success and sales is almost the exact same thing. And they're going to become more and more similar. Right. And, and, and also the seed and grow approach of, I mean, unless you're selling a major enterprise solution that is just locked in. Okay. It's, you know, a couple hundred thousand and people don't buy that way anymore. Right. They buy, they want to, to, to your point of the consumerization, right? It's yeah. like, I want to try it. I want to see what this thing yeah. does. I want to then, I want to be educated and help me. And then all of a sudden, okay, great. Right. So yep. that's where this, all the stuff that you're doing isn't just a lot. You know, I think a lot of people look at account based marketing as, pre-sales stuff, right? Like, hey, help me figure out. But it's also ju just as if not more important with existing customers. Exactly, exactly. So those, that's kind of where I see it going is those, all of our roles kind of converging together and um, just being a lot more cross-functional, which is fun. I mean, that's the stuff yeah. we all love. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, I think we're, go we're moving away from the, the, the loan sales rep out there with a territory and just go hunt and kill whatever you want. You know what right. I mean? Like right. the most successful uh, organizations I see were, you know, we're, are working together hand in hand, marketing, sales, customer success, you know, everybody trying to figure out how can we best get that, educate that client in the right way without pissing them off. Um, I think, I do think we have a long way to go. I, I really do think we're not there yet. Uh, I mean, I think- I think we're closer than you think. I, I think you are closer than, than I think. You know, I, I think you and what you do and maybe with your customers, but I think on mass, I, I think we have a very, I, I also have a very, you know, for me, most of the clients that I work with are in the SaaS world. And I constantly have to be pulling myself out of the San Francisco SaaS world and realizing that that's such a, bubble of weirdness that you know you, you go one step out in one down market and it's like sales back in the early 2000s again you know what i mean and those type of things so so i do i do think for the clients that are doing it right and with your solutions and and, and some like it i think there is there is a kind of guiding light that says yeah like it's here if you do it right but i think doing it right is a, a very relative term if you put it if, if you put it that way yeah yeah, I, I think technology can be a catalyst for change. And that's One more question on that, because I think everybody does look for, you said something that was interesting, which is, you know, uh, no process, no, per, no, that type of thing, right? But I do think people are almost trying too hard to look for a technical solution to what I think is an alignment issue. So where do we start? Before I invest in a technology, how do I have to make sure that, internally we're aligned to make sure that that tech, that we're going to get the most out of that tech. And I'll use any, forget about ABM for a second, Salesforce. You know what I mean? Like if you're not aligned of how the organization is going to use Salesforce, sales, Salesforce actually might become worse, make things worse because all of a sudden it's a rat's nest and all, you know, who's doing what and whatever sales loft outreach, any one of these marketing on earth or sales automation tools. It's like, again, if you're not aligned with how it's written, you know, fundamentally from a process standpoint, a people standpoint, layering that technology could make it fail. Are there some key things that you need to do as an organization to make sure that you're aligned the right way before implementing an ABM strategy? Yeah, I mean, I kind of joke, you know, whenever my team wants to buy technology, I'm like, uh, did you try it on a spreadsheet first? Like Excel is still pretty amazing for a lot of stuff. <laughs> 
was, you know, so it's like, you know, but joking aside with that, I also think about is this like, there's platforms and apps. And so I think about what, what do I want my team working in that's a platform? And if it is a platform, that, that is a more significant alignment, people process technology mm -hmm. play. Um, and when you do a platform evaluation, you, you know, I always look for how open is that platform? Can I build on that platform? Mm -hmm. If people do want to go out and buy an app, can I bring it in to my platform so no one has to know, right? Because so much of, of adoption is like, I don't want to be in a swivel chair working in this thing, then that thing, then that thing. Um, the other thing on the MarTech side specifically is ABM platforms are emerging that have, so you don't have to have an intent you don't have to have an intent data provider. You don't have to have a bunch of third party data providers. You don't have to have another provider to do website de-anonymization. You don't have to do, have someone to do display ads, another person for reporting, um, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, there's, there's this convergence of call it six to eight technologies that before people had to buy separately that are now kind of becoming the the bill of materials for a great abm platform cool i love it so i you know i i probably could ask you a million more questions because i i am very like you know skeptical but like fearful <laughs> and hopeful all at the same time with yeah. abm yeah. And ai and all that other stuff but um just because you know try to keep it at 30 45 minutes uh, sure yeah definitely with that, talk, tell us a little bit about six cents and and you know if people are interested where can they find you um, because I think what you're working on is pretty, is, is like I said, and you know, if done right, you know, you guys are kicking some ass there. So you want to kind of give the audience a little explanation, what Sixth Sense is all about, where they can find more information? Yeah, sure. So we are an account-based orchestration platform, um, designed for that full revenue team, like I talked about. So we're designed for marketing, BDRs, sales, customer success, um, to be able to essentially power them with AI, big data, machine learning, and even orchestration. So think next best action uh, in one platform um, that allows them to see that full customer journey. So you can see all of their anonymous behavior that I talked about. You can see those persona maps, red, yellow, green. And really it's about helping shepherd them through the new way they want to buy. Because we have to adjust. And so because our platform was really built in this more modern era, we understand that new buying journey and have really designed our, our platform to be able to accommodate that and make companies that, that use us really successful. So I talked about getting into deals early. Mm -hmm. I talked about knowing what competitors are in a deal. Um, I talked about being able to prioritize for timing um, uncovering that dark funnel. You know, those are the things that people look to six cents to do. Love it. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole consumerization of, of B2, B, B2C going to B2B, I mean, we're just, we're just too used to it. And, and, and if we don't adopt or adapt, if you will, as B2B sellers, the, the consumer will dictate our success. Well, right? and it's still about getting there first. It is. It is. And the people that adopt will get there first because the buyer will want to engage with them. Exactly. Awesome. Well, Latane, thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, it, it got me thinking about some stuff and, and uh, how my team actually needs to do a hell of a lot better job at figuring out where people are. So, cause I, we're evolving right now ourselves looking at, you know, how can we engage at the right time with the right, you know, it, it's small sidebar, you know, the, the training that I took when I was at, it, it was called Basho and the email uh, there, there was one very specific email approach that was, it was created by this guy, Jeff Hoffman It's called the why you, why you now. And it's, oh, the, yep, I know that. Yeah. So and the whole idea is you're on your website. Hey, I, I saw you open up a new office, whatever that is. And the reason it prompted me to reach out to you is because we help companies that right, super personalized, whatever, great four or five, six years ago. Now it's watered down a little bit because of all this, but whatever, what was interesting was he posted something, uh, about the why you, why you now that I had never thought of stupid me. I've been training this for 10 years. And he's like, those are the two questions that you need to answer if you're going to expect a decent response rate. 
why you? Why am I reaching out to you compared to the 15 other people I right. can reach out to? And why you right now versus last week versus tomorrow versus next month? And if you can genuinely answer those questions, then you should expect a pretty high response rate. If you can't, good luck. Yeah, and we can help, you know, empower people to be able to answer those at a click. So, you know, and if people, we have a new program called Start Uncovering Now. So I, I talked about kind of that dark funnel. So mm -hmm. if people want to come to us, um, we can start de-anonymizing your website. It only takes 24 hours. Nice. Um, so you can start to see, you know, that anonymous behavior. Um, and we should get you a demo. Yeah, absolutely. Put it on. Uh, <laughs> my CRO, take a look at this on the list. Uh, we're evaluating our whole tech stack here in the next couple of months. So uh, I'll make sure you guys are on that list. And I'd love All to right. look at what this, what this stuff can do. Awesome. Awesome. We'll safe, uh, have a safe flight. Thank you very much. It'll be an interesting week. Like I said, Dublin landing and doing training, and then uh, Dublin and then London, London, and then back, and then San Francisco all week next week. So it's, uh, I was in Dubai last week, which was super interesting, but uh, but now it's you know now coming back a little bit in the uh, and then back west coast. So is the life. But uh, <laughs> cool. Well, everybody, as usual, I hopefully you all got some good value out of this conversation. I know I did. And uh, do me a favor, go out there and make somebody happy today, ladies and gentlemen. If you do nothing else today, make somebody smile. You know you did. You had a really good day. All right. So have a great week and let's make it happen. Thank you all very much. Later on. Make it happen. <laughs>